After what feels like hundreds of years worth of inane complaining, the live-action adaptation of Ghost in the Shell finally saw its theatrical release in the States. There's been a tear in the fandom over whether or not it was good or bad, and neither side can come up with a definitive answer. I don't want to immediately shit on the movie because it did manage to get a few things right. The opening scene where you see the Major being born was a pretty cool recreation of the scene from the original movie. While lacking the original music that made it much more dramatic, there was a screening in Japan with a full orchestra which made it as cool as it was intense. On that note, all the shot-for-shot -shot recreations of the 1995 movie were as close to perfect as a live-action version could be. I don't want to go as far as saying that the cinematography was on par with some of my favorite visually striking scenes, but it was competent. The CG was actually pretty good. There are one or two scenes where it looked a bit rough, but what movie isn't these days? District 9, you fucker. I can't really fault the visuals in this movie, but I will call into question a few of their major design choices. In both the Masamune movies and the TV series, the city looks crowded and urban. It's supposed to be based off of Kowloon City in China, densely populated and kind of dirty. When seen from afar, it looks like a darkened city skyline, reminiscent of Tokyo and Hong Kong. For obvious reasons, the movie felt it was necessary to make it look like Blade Runner, because that's everyone's goddamn point of reference for some reason. There's literally hundreds of building-sized holographic advertisements invading every bit of free space in the city. I guess they need to keep hammering away at the fact that this is THE future. It's not awful in its own right, but it's not Ghost in the Shell. Even the streets and highways look more like Korea and Cloud Atlas than a near-future Tokyo. This is in stark contrast to what the city looks like during the daytime hours. Both the settings in the 1995 movie and standalone complex felt like realistic night and day versions of themselves. There wasn't really a stark aesthetic contrast between them. Compare that to this. I get that giant holograms probably don't show up as well during the day, but it doesn't really explain how the city goes from Korean Cloud Atlas to Chinese slums just because the sun is out. And this isn't really anything like Osama Tezuka's Metropolis, where multiple and sometimes clashing aesthetics for the environments were present to showcase the different socioeconomic classes of the city. I think the contrast may have been a bit less bothersome if we got a better establishing shot of the city rather than just what we saw in the trailer, but I guess they didn't have too meticulous of a plan for the environmental design. The story of this movie isn't messy per se, but feels kind of poorly pieced together. I was actually surprised to learn that this wasn't a one-to-one -one adaptation of the 1995 movie, especially considering almost every scene in the trailers was taken directly from Oshi's work. It isn't even an adaptation of any one series in the franchise, instead it tries to take all of the media and compresses it into one story. It's like they weren't confident that the movie would garner enough positive reception for a sequel. Let's take a look at what plot elements can be found in this movie. Mamoru Oshii's first movie still serves as a skeleton for the story, scenes like the Thermoptic camo fight and the spider tank are still present. The robot attacks come from the 2006 sequel, Innocence. Section 9 gets burned and becomes an enemy of their partner organization, like in Standalone Complex. Kuze, the villain, comes from the second season of Standalone Complex, called Second Gig. Oh, and the Major's outfit from the 2014 series Arise makes an appearance. It feels like the writers looked at the franchise, took all their favorite parts, and then kind of forgot what made them good to begin with. Ghost in the Shell is more than just an action, police, cyberpunk thriller. It's first and foremost a vehicle designed to examine how humanity will change during the eventual singularity, the point where humanity and technology become one. The biggest question it asks is, what do we become when we transcend our flesh? The 1995 movie wonders whether our species can continue to procreate in a world where the body can be manufactured and the mind can be edited. Standalone Complex tackles the idea of copycat behavior in an ultra-connected society. It explores how the spontaneous generation of copycat ideas and behavior can occur without necessarily having an original to copy from. This is further explored in Second Gig where the concept is applied to the political theater. If such behavior can exist, then can people be manipulated into the de facto behavior? I don't really want to talk about Arise because I don't think it was particularly amazing and it didn't add much philosophical value to the franchise. The 2017 movie not only asks the most milquetoast version of the question by wondering whether or not human brains in cyborg bodies are still human, but seeks to actually come up with an answer to the question. Scarlett Johansson ends the movie by saying, yes, we still are human. It's not the point. It's an open-ended question that's supposed to spur conversation. This is philosophy 101 here, Hollywood. Come on. What's worse is that there are scenes in the movie that are supposed to be spaces for discourse, but instead we get watered-down conversations that lead to weak character development. 
the boat scene. It's in the new movie. They're on the fucking boat, but they don't talk about anything important. The characterization in this movie isn't the best, but by no means is it the worst. Most of the characters feel like themselves, but there are a few inconsistencies that are worth nitpicking. Togusa, for example, is full human in this. It doesn't alter the story in any meaningful way, but it's worth noting that he was a full cyborg in the manga and just had a cyber brain in the TV series. Bato doesn't have his signature eyes at the beginning of the movie. I guess they were trying to give him some form of character development. Who knows? Takeshi Kitano plays Chief Aramaki. I wonder how Japanese audiences reacted to his inclusion in the movie. It's hard to call his performance Oscar-worthy acting, or even really acting that much, as he mostly just stands there and thinks his orders to the rest of his team. He did have one scene where he uses a revolver to gun down some guys from Hanka that were trying to kill him. I'm pretty sure Togusa is the only character with a fondness for revolvers in Section 9, and it was a deliberate choice to give Aramaki the gun. The holster even had an engraving of a samurai on it. Now, let's talk about the fucking elephant in the room. Whitewashing. Everyone and their mother on social media has a problem with Hollywood whitewashing. They're not wrong. There are issues with diversity in Hollywood, and there's no real good reason for it beyond an archaic stigma of casting coloreds or something. A lot of people are angry about it, but the anger tends to come from a political dissatisfaction rather than concerns for the sanctity of the series. I will say that it's undeniably silly how they handled the Major's origin. In the 2017 version, Motoko Kusanagi has her name changed to Major Mira Killian for plot purposes once she gets her new body, but somehow she was originally a Japanese girl named Motoko Kusanagi. Nobody can argue that this is pointless whitewashing. Her ethnicity before or after barely seem relevant to the plot. There is a subplot with her Japanese mom, but once more it doesn't really change anything. It could have been any mother. What's worth arguing is how director Rupert Sanders, producer Avi Arad, and DreamWorks handled it. Neither this journalist, nor the angry masses, nor the studio seems to understand who she is. Motoko Kusanagi isn't a birth name given to a person, it's an alias. The Major's had synthetic bodies since she was a child and her true identity was lost. She doesn't even remember it. So it doesn't really matter who plays her because she can be anyone. In Standalone Complex, she's even shown to have multiple bodies that vary between size, gender, and age. She doesn't have to be exclusively Japanese, but nothing forces her to be white either. It feels like they were just aiming to get somebody who could sell the movie as well as look decent enough in purple hair to pull off the role. What's even more odd is that people only seem to have a problem with the major being whitewashed. Nobody noticed that Ishikawa was played by an Australian actor named Lazarus Ratur. That's brownwashing, which I guess is fine. Also, Denuzia Samal played some character named Ladira, or Ladria. She was made up for the movie, but I guess she replaces Pazu? I'm not really sure why they would just outright erase the character's existence and replace him with a new character portrayed by a non-male, non-Japanese actress. Nobody including this same journalist seemed to be bothered by Togusa's portrayal either. He was played by Singapore actor Chin Han. I don't think I heard any outrage over a Japanese character being played by a Chinese actor, but I guess all Asians look the same to us filthy gaijins. So are you Chinese or Japanese? I can't recall any outrage about the casting for the live-action Attack on Titan movies and how a majority of the characters were yellow-washed. I guess race issues don't bother Japanese moviegoers nearly as much. According to a few articles I've read, the movie did better in its opening weekend in Japan than in the States. There isn't much information regarding the movie's reception in Japan, but it's worth noting that its Yahoo Japan movie score was higher than the original film. The few news outlets reporting on its reception seem to be recycling the same quotes from two fans about Scarlett Johansson's casting, which was positive. Also, the Japanese man Yuda came out with a video where he asked a few people on the streets of Japan about whitewashing. The few people he asked either didn't think it mattered or thought that Scarlett Johansson was a pretty good pick for the role. Even original director Mamoru Oshii expressed his approval. He went so far as to say that there really is no right or wrong race to cast and that the outcry might have been a political move. Kodansha's director of international business, Sam Yoshiba, said, Looking at her career so far, I think Scarlett Johansson is well cast. We never imagined it would be a Japanese actress in the first place. But you should take his words with a grain of salt, as he represents people who intend to profit from the movie's success. The only person in this opinion who should serve as the definitive authority on the matter is the series creator, Shiro Masamune. He hasn't said a thing about the movie, as far as I can tell. Based on the evidence presented, I'm going to have to side with Japanese fans on this one. The race debate in Hollywood is its own problem, but if whitewashing doesn't bother the people it's supposed to be directly harming, then why should non-Japanese people be bothered? The biggest problem with this movie is that it focused predominantly on style and very little on substance. Ironically, the plot of Ghost in the Shell 2017 is the perfect analogy for itself. It was given new life, turned into a different person, and then struggled to remember its origins. 